good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar which is titled getting your ai to do your ai through ibm data science platform this webinar is brought to you by express computer in partnership with ibm i'm mohit ratho senior correspondent with express computer you know fueled by data artificial intelligence is transforming how businesses operate and deliver value while improving efficiencies across the organization however to successfully scale ai throughout your organizations you must overcome data complexity talent scarcity and a lack of trust in ai systems it is also important to remember that there is no ai without ia which is information architecture to meet the demands of today and stay competitive tomorrow these architectures need to be efficient and agile there is a need for an agile and resilient cloud native cloud native platform that enables clients to succeed with ai regardless of the unique data and cloud landscape but before we take the session forward i will give out some of the information regarding this webinar this is an audio and video webinar which is being broadcasted live and will be available as on demand we will have a round of q and a at the end of the webinar however you can send in your questions at any time during the webinar using the questions text box we will also have a survey at the end of the webinar so i request you all to participate in the same in case you face any technical issues please try to refresh your web browser or reach out to our team using the questions text box well if you have any further questions or if you wish to interact with our speakers please leave a comment using the same questions text box and our team will get back to you post the webinar so that's all from my side now without taking much of your time i would like to invite our speakers for the day to discuss more on this topic today we are joined by mr rakesh meher who is segment leader information architecture ibm data and ai group india and south asia and we are also joined by mr jeremiah joseph chief architect data elite team so without taking much of your time i hand over the floor to rakesh hey thank you mohit good afternoon everyone thanks a lot for joining this session so yes. thank you once again thank you everyone for joining and uh, today we are going to talk about how ai can be deployed to build your ai applications at scale and trust me it's not going to be an experience like watching the movie back to the future back in the 1970s or 80s it's going to be a real experience what exactly we are doing with our customers we'll share some real use cases um, our senior data scientist uh, mr jj will also show you live the some of the manifestation of the technology to you through demo and use cases so hold your seat tight and let's get started with that so you we firmly believe uh, after our careful research discussion with the cdo cio that there is no ai without an ia ai is probably one of the most abused term in the industry and i'm not going to explain what is ai but i will certainly explain what is ia ia is information architecture if you do not have a basic foundation for ai to flourish it will not be able to take off at an enterprise scale and that's the reason why most of the times 80% of the organizations the ai projects become pet projects they stay in a nook and a corner and that's it they never see the light of the day now what is ia so let me give you an example i'm a cook okay so i cook well my at least my wife says i'm a good cook and when you plan for a particular recipe right for that recipe there are certain basic ingredients and the shape of those vegetables whether it will be cube shaped or be julienne or what is the shape it is okay it has to be as per the recipe now do you just go out to the sabji mandi or the local language that we call it and then just buy the vegetables and bring and dump it in a wok no right you process it right you get it into the desired shape so that you can make it ready for the recipe and that's exactly what information architecture is it's a platform as a scheme of things like tools processes timing in which you build those basic fundamental blocks for ai to work at scale by making your data ai ready i mean you can't just expect that you dump the data in every possible form and then ai to pick it up 
right? It doesn't happen that way. So you need to have a solid information architecture for the data from the point of inception or the creation to the point of visualization. Entire metamorphosis, the data should be curated and created and make it ready in the form in such a way that AI can consume it to give you the desired result, right? Now, why do we go for AI? There are two kinds of companies companies in the world now or in the next three years there will be two kind of companies companies who will be or who have already adopted ai as one of the mainstream uh, strategy or the second category of the company who are going to be extinct because they did not adopt ai at the right time and to do that you need some degree of modernization and that modernization requires a single information architecture across the enterprise and that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, now, before do, I, I go into the depth of modernization and how data scientists play an important role, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, let me share a few concerns of a chief data officer in an organization. The first one is, how will I get unified data quality across the enterprise from all data sources, including the social platform? I remember this discussion with one of the CIOs um, of a bank down south. And, and she was talking about, you know, Rakesh, how can I get all the data in one, one landing zone? But then it should not be a data swamp. It should be a data lake. And you would not be able to recollect many such projects which are actually a governed data lake and not a data swamp. You can relate it to it very well. The second one is, how a data science platform on cloud, okay? I mean, you have already adopted, and this is exactly a live example a couple of days back, and it is my favorite example, that um, they have adopted a cloud platform, which provides um, the data science platform along with the uh, laundry list of other services. Now, this gentleman is having issues in transferring the critical data to the data science landing zone where his data scientist is able to analyze the data. Because it, it, it go, first of all, he needs to go through a lot of regulatory challenges. At the same time, moving the data to the cloud for such purposes is actually pretty expensive. He has already subscribed to a data science platform at a very nominal cost, at a very lucrative cost. But then the real challenge lies beyond that. It is not about only the data science platform owning that ownership, it actually the add-on cost on top of it. And that becomes a huge, huge concern. And it is not only money, it is also the cumbersome task of moving the data from on-prem data uh, sources to the cloud, right? The third one is, you know, my so this, this is another insurance company. I was sharing that um, uh, platform with him the other day and he was telling me, Rakesh, you know what? I'm getting the uh, model curated on my data science platform. And then um, when I'm handing over that outcome, the model outcome to my business team, they're asking me about the reason why this set of customers has been chosen for this targeted campaign. And <laughs> trust me, I have no answers for that. Why? Because what are the platform they have adopted? It lacks explainability, right? So it, it, it doesn't have that ability to explain why the model has selected this set of data. And we call that rationalization behind AI or the data model explainability. The, the final one, which is a big concern, is you know, in a, in a good sizable company, um, you would have at least 10 data scientists and data scientists are pretty expensive resources, isn't it? And the annual outgo would be in the tune of three to four crores. And every month or quarter, the the head of data scientist team has to give, a, 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 has to reason with the CFO about the investment on those uh, data scientists. That, and he doesn't have a KPI or some sort of manifestation that my data scientists are doing good and this is the outcome because for building models uh, and everything, all those exercises, it takes time. If you go through traditional processes, now what if all these concerns will be addressed by AI itself? let the AI work to build AI for you. I'm just trying to reason with you, which is in, in streamline with the theme of the today's presentation. Now, how can I do that? Remember the way you know, your DevOps platform is, 
we believe after a lot of interactions with our customers, the data analysis process should also be kind of a CI-CD, continuous integration, continuous development. You should not wait for the data to come to you for, for crunching it on a, on a landing zone or a, or a data science uh, sand pit. No, you should not. It should be hybrid in nature, cloud native in nature. You should have all the security and governance protocol in place, availing the right data. I remember this, this is very important. Availing the right data at the right time to the right set of people. You are democratizing the data, but at the same time, having a proper governance around it. The governance term has been neglected for very long. And now the industry is waking up to this. At the end of the day, how are you improving the user experience? So we'll talk about all this today. Now, let me give you a little 30,000 feet view here, why organizations, they fail. Now, you remember I was talking about the IA ladder, there is no AI without an IA. The information architecture has various rungs. So you imagine it is a ladder, okay? And it has various rungs. And these are the rungs of that data ladder. One is collect, one is organize, one is analyze, and the last one is infuse. Now, why most of the companies, they fail because they try to jump from here directly to here, okay? And that is why they fail because this particular task should have been carried out by coming from to here, from collect to organize, then from organize to analyze. And somehow the irony of the situation is they just skip this organized part somehow. And that is where they fail. Now, what are these collect, organize and analyze? I just wanted to give you a teaser there. Collect is about, so these are three fundamental building blocks on any data platform or any analytics um, use cases or exercise. So collect, is a fundamental platform in which you collect the different data from system of records, from system of engagement through different processes. Maybe it's a database or data warehousing or data lake or through data virtualization also, right? You collect the data. Now, after collecting the data, you should do a proper governance around it. The data should be organized. The quality of the data should be improved. There should be policies and rules who are accessing the data, who should not access the data. You should have the provision to mask the data if somebody is not supposed to look at it. You should also be able to create an enterprise-wide data dictionary. Now that's the need of the hour. The government is coming up with the data protection law. And if the data protection law is around the corner and you don't have a system to give an enterprise dictionary to your users, oh boy, you are in trouble. Okay, and the last one is it should be a self-service platform, right? And then you should be in a position to launch yourself into the data science world. And usually, as I mentioned earlier, we always neglect this organized part. And my uh, colleague is gonna talk about the importance of it and we will show you the real challenges and also how can we address this. Now, all these things now, what IBM has done, because you know IBM has a laundry list of software in addressing the analytics requirements at various levels of these fundamental blocks, we have put together all this as a microservices offering, a cloud native offering, which can be hosted on any cloud. Okay, and that's the beauty of it. And these are all modular in nature. What does it mean? So suppose you already have a full blown data warehousing, uh, a very mature data collection uh, fundamental block, we can coexist with that. You don't need to replace it all. You just pick one part of data organized and can you know, simply get started with it. I'll just give you an example in this architectural diagram, which is, you know, you can see and you can articulate, I don't need to spend much time on this, the different modules, the integration phase, the data management uh, layer, the data access layer, the actionable insight layer. What we have done is we have brought the best of the IBM services software, and also weaved it very seamlessly with the best of the open source world. Now you'd be asking, why would I take open source from IBM? Of course, you need to do that because when IBM provides you those open source platforms and the, and the services, it is already pre-validated. The security concerns has been addressed and it is enterprise ready. So we are bringing the best of the both worlds, putting it together on a microservices platform. And then the beauty is, you can pick and choose. It's like an a la carte model. You can pick and choose and just start with that. Another beauty of this entire platform 
there's you know <laughs> you can say that uh, ibm was uh, oh, we are not that good in giving you a unified licensing now we have addressed that so what we have done is whatever offering you want to take and that you just need to enable it on your platform which jj is going to show it to you and that's it use that only pay for that and this entire licensing is a single unified metric virtual processing core vpc that's it if you are taking 48 cores of vpcs of any of these then we call that cloud pack for data that's it and you take it and you use it either for data virtualization or use it for watson studio or use it for streams that's your choice completely you can bring down the uh, data virtualization service bring up the data science uh, service as long as you're staying within the 48 cores of the entire platform you're good to go no challenges there right um you know some of the uh, features of this is you you can avoid the lock-in today you are on aws tomorrow just lift and ship and go to azure or any on-prem cloud eliminate the data silos data can be collected from any sources these are a couple of manifestations on how our customers have achieved the kind of returns on this platform and uh, this is open by design as i mentioned all the open source or most of the open sources platform uh, you can already suppose you have just just as teaser not spoiling the entire excitement uh, jj but you can actually you have built your data science models on python or jupyter notebook just put it on watson studio and you can you just work the way you are working and by doing that you are not only deploying the ai at your disposal to build your own ai solutions but also you are being taken care of and you become the cloud native infra there um some of the you know ai requirements and the distinct features of it the license model is unified it's a containerized platform as i mentioned microservices the k8 architecture is all pre-integrated it has been rated as number one in gartner's and foresters of the world you can see that and then remember this insight platform is a combination of all these things someone might be top in the in the in the data science platform but what's the use of it if you are not able to draw insight by utilizing this platform so when it's about data insight platform it's a combination of some basic building blocks which jj is going to talk about today and that is how a, a mature insight platform comes into action and becomes very handy otherwise anyway we are on the individual level also we are in the top quadrants in the forests in the gardeners of the world we have a lot of client stories as well which we'll talk in the due course of time i just wanted to put it as a teaser pin it on your wall and um, now i would like to hand over to our senior data scientist jj uh, for him to give you a real manifestation of our technology uh, but before that um, Chan, can we have the first uh, poll question here okay great so some excitement for you guys um, so just feel free to answer this how long does it take for the model development end to end in your organization starting from the idea curation to a fully blown model which you can hand over the output to your business usually how much time does it take please feel free to choose the other right option here based on your experience okay so um just help me guys uh, once when jj is ready we can hand over this to him okay we've got this some some real excitement here exciting feedback so six to twelve months this is what i'm talking about you will only be able to outshine your peer if you fail fast if you are not failing fast that means you are taking a lot of time in curating the model maybe you are taking six months time just to realize the model that you have create you created or curated is actually not the right model and i'm sure jj is going to talk about right jj how auto ai uh, can help you in building the right models in a nick of a time okay right, right. over to you jj hey thank you rakesh uh, thank you folks for joining in for this uh, session going by the theme right what we wanted to showcase today is how ai um, we have been using AI traditionally for a lot of uh, in a lot of areas right um, be it um, looking at the customer behavioral patterns, uh, understanding the cohort behavior of the customer or the hyper-personalization view, which is the latest trend in the marketing so that you can have a tailor-made customer, um, analyze the customer affinity towards the product, so and so forth. Correct? So how what is it that's making all of this happen? Um, 
So, so the idea here is, um, um, uh, we, I want to set the context today, uh, just like AI is being used in multiple other areas, be it healthcare, be it finance, or be it um, um, uh, the genome analytics, which is, which is what today people are trying to analyze the variants of the virus and be it the financial domain and stuff like that, right? Uh, with today's theme, we also wanted to cover uh, things like uh, uh, the theme being uh, using AI to get your AI work done right uh, be whatever be the domain so for which we'll take one use case um, setting the context again um, 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 the role of an underwriter in 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 the more uh, in the finance space uh, be it insurance uh, uh, be it the banking sector the retail banking um, the idea of uh, the the underwriter actually does a risk assessment right and predominantly, traditionally, it's always done with a certain set of um, uh, uh, traditional uh, demographic markers. Now, by employing machine learning or AI, what we really do is with the explosion of data being um, uh, available, uh, data has been thrown at rates, which is humongous, right? Why don't we tap into that data and get more insights than um, what a human can actually assimilate? Offload that off to the system. That is where your machine learning is coming into play, right? You teach the machine, look at the data which has been thrown at, and try to help me with the assessment of the uh, uh, assessment of the situation. So we will take the risk assessment model, uh, trying to assess whether a person who's approaching uh, uh, to a bank should I really um uh, give him loan so um so before we said uh, get into that right i just want to quickly cover the architecture of the solution and how is it really um, um uh, beneficial and uh, how is it really uh, what we call it as true cloud native application when you look at uh, what i'm uh, projecting on the screen is a set of uh, uh, rhl uh, um, uh, servers right um, and um, uh, end of the day right uh, virtualization uh, reduces your compute to a VM, right? Uh, what OpenShift does is, what we have done is, we have taken all of our data, enterprise uh, data managing solutions and co converted into a containerized solution. What that really means is, we have uh, reduced the uh, compute into what we call it as the, the unit of compute into a much smaller than a VM, calling it as containers. Now, a single VM can host multiple containers, and mind you, the beauty is no VM is or no server is locked to only single job. So any given point of time, if the VM is free, it can donate its resource and any container can be instantiated. Now your container could run your ETL workload or it could run your BI load workload or it could run your data science, depending upon how free uh, the system is. Uh, in the traditional approach, you install a server and you, for instance, put in an ETL tool into it. The system is reserved for the ETL, the entire system. And when the ETL is not running, the uh, resources are, is sitting idle there. Now with the container-based approach, what happens is the system can donate this resource to the uh, server and everything being container, the, uh, the server will, when it is sitting idle, can, uh, which is supposed to do the ETL job, can take up and do the data science loop. So your hardware is much more efficiently used. And the beauty is this can be deployed anywhere, okay? Uh, it can be deployed on, uh, uh, in any of the available cloud services, be it IBM, or uh, you di directly procure a managed OpenShift environment, then we can get all of this whole cloud pack for data onto it, or be it AWS Azure, OpenStack, Google, whatever it is, and even on the edge, the system is, pro uh, it is comfortable running it. Now, when you look at the whole journey, right, we will just talk about, focus about three major areas today for the today's theme that is how ai is going to help you in managing your scattered data that is the prepare part of the whole whole journey second is uh, once a model is created how do i monetize the data which is already um, curated for me uh, third is once a model is deployed that is ai uh, and ml is put into use how do i gain um, uh, mileage out of it so, so i was looking at the poll and it is pretty much in line with uh, uh, the research, what we, or the study, what we have conducted. To put up a model uh, or ML model into, or a AI model uh, in, in, into deployment and get it uh, running, typically the time period is uh, somewhere between six to 12 months, depending upon the complexity model. But with AI coming to your aid, right, you can get your model up and running in a matter of days. 
and we'll see how we are going to do that. We'll break the journey into three phases. One is trying to understand your data, prepping up the data in line with the risk model. As an example, what we're going to take. Second is once the data is organized, uh, we will see how a model could be created out of uh, the organized data. Third is once a model is deployed, right? How can I continuously, AI comes in and uh, continuously helps you to improve the model. So as I said, right, uh, uh, without data, you're just another person with an opinion, correct? Data is exploding. We have data being churned out from different systems in an organization. And uh, the, the biggest challenge for anyone is um, with most of the organization as for the Forrester study is trying to tap into that data, trying to know what where this data is lying in your whole big data platform, correct? So if I, I put in an example, I, 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 uh, if you look at the slide, which is put up, right? The left extreme, you're seeing all the books and papers lying in a pile, which is where your data is today. Uh, and there are multiple applications in an organization which will be doing, uh, uh, um, which is maintaining its own system of records and collecting humongous data for a pointed, um, um, uh, for a focused area or transactions, right? All of this data is being collected, but then problem is for me to get to know what data is collected by who is, is pretty much unorganized. Like in the left side of the picture, where you see the pile of papers put in. Uh, what A does here is it looks into the data, organizes your data for you or using ML and uh, Watson NLP uh, services. And it organizes, that is what you're seeing in the bit, in the middle portion where the books are arranged neatly in, in the shelves. The second part is once I've got my data organized, how do I consume it, right? So with that, we'll quickly switch over to the demo, uh, which I've got. So what we are attempting to do, uh, do here is for the risk profiling, right? I'm trying trying to search for a piece of information in the system uh, from my organized uh, or catalog data, right? In the instant case, I'm trying to look at and search for account number. The moment I, uh, the moment I say, find for me account number from the business terms, the system does a search and quickly brings out a list of account number related uh, business terms. And the moment I click on account number, the details about account number as a business glossary, the published uh, dictionary, it brings it up on the screen for you. So when you look at it, the system uh, tells what is account number all about and to what um, 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 uh, uh, category does it belong to and what are the re relations. Now the same thing can be pulled out and understood from a graphical format. So I'll just say explore relation. So mind you, I'm starting up with a journey of trying to understand uh, 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 the customer profile information so that I can create a risk based model for which I right away start off uh, by searching for account number. The moment I do that, okay, you will see in the screen that the account number is bought and it says that it belongs to a, 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 a category called customer segmentation. And there are three other terms that are associated with it. That is, it is got, it is associated with the credit card account, loan account and current account, correct? Apart from that, it is also mapping it to the actual uh, source where it is uh, uh, account number information is available. That is what we call about, what we refer to as data being organized, right? And cataloged. So when I search for account number, what is happening is the system is also bringing in all the associated account number related uh, entities for you. Uh, and at the same time, it is also telling you where exactly in your database, the data is available. So if you see, it is available in a table called customer summary, right? And um, there are two other terms within that table, which is related to the customer. I can go ahead, expand the whole thing and see what are the uh, what that uh, database table contains uh, 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 how many tables does it contain and what columns does it have so in effect what you're trying to do here is you're looking at you were able to quickly launch out and understand where account related information is uh, put up and uh, what are the other columns potentially available in that schema now let's look at and see how is this whole data being organized if you see there are 197 terms okay um, uh, and it belongs to uh, the category called industry uh, accelerator. The moment I uh, expand all my 197 uh, terms, the system pulls up all the manifest, all the cataloged business terms along with the relations and stuff. Um, so what we did really do here is using a term, I could actually narrow down and understand where my data or knowledge is locked up. 
I could get an understa understanding of what, uh, where exactly uh, is the database uh, the term is mapped to and all the related terms, right? Now, when you look at it, there are two distinct activities which is happening here. A business term, which enables you to search for the terms, what we're looking for, and uh, the availability of the content, right? Which is, which is trying to tell you which database. If you go back to the uh, allegory we were referring to, wherein the, uh, the knowledge is put up in a pile of uh, pages and it gets organized neatly, which is what we call it as cataloged information or curated information. Then from that, we have also added uh, onloaded business terms so that it becomes easy for you to search. In other words, it is also trying to tell what knowledge is logged up in each data. Uh, so that being the first piece of our journey, right? That is prepping, prepping our, uh, our, our data. Let's see how AI is coming to uh, play here. So I go back here and there's something called as uh, data discovery. I launch, on, launch it. Uh, this is a place where I'm trying to introduce a new data to my system. So there's something called as launch uh, uh, discovery. At this point, right, the system is leveraging ML and it can actually look at the data, inspect the data for you and unearth, um, uh, uh, broadly, we are talking about two things here, looking at the quality of the data, one thing. Second thing is trying to understand what knowledge is locked up in the data. So system, uh, you're exposing the data, raw data to the system. You're not uh, actually knowing what is in, in the, uh, what, what kind of data is available. All I'm just uh, uh, letting the system do is pointing to a database, right? So the moment I launch a discovery, the system will do the uh, discovery for you em employing sampling techniques and machine learning and AI uh, uh, services. And what it does is it looks through the data, okay? It does an analysis for you, uh, does a data quality check for you and pulls up. Now, if you look at here, right, what it is actually trying to tell you is I analyze your database for you, and there are a set of four tables which is put up there. And uh, at a at a high level, what it is also trying to show you show me is what is the quality of the data which has been uh, um, uh, analyzed by the system, uh, powered by AI. So at the first set, you see right there's a data quality score given out here, and on the right hand side, it tries to tell what is the referential integrity which has been maintained. And the bottom most, you have something called as classes of data. In other words, right? Uh, what are the different, uh, in other words, it is trying to tell you what is the knowledge which is locked up in the database. Now, when I look, I open up and see the single ta uh, table by table analysis, right? It also tells me what, what is the quality of the data which is put up there. So we'll let it load. So you see that the data quality has been rated 98%, okay? And then the threshold value, what I've put it is to be 80. These are all configurable, trying to tell the system or the ML algorithm saying that, hey, I want the threshold to be 80, just treat it to be a good data if the threshold quality is better than that. Now, how did we arrive at the data quality? So there are a set of 10 different dimensions we analyze the data. Uh, in fact, with the latest version of uh, Cloud Pack for Data, I think it's now 11 to 12 uh, different dimensions where we analyze the data. If you see, right, it looks at data class violation. It looks at suspected incorrect values. It looks at duplicated values. It looks at out of range values. Okay, it looks at uh, uh, what we call it as how, how much is the missing value uh, and how consistent or inconsistent is the data. And it also shows you in terms of percentage, what's the data violation, which ultimately gets uh, summarized into one single score, uh, which is what we are looking at as 98%. So the beauty here is all I'm telling is, look at this, these tables to the system and handing over the, uh, the ML, uh, ML component, ML engine, uh, and asking the ML to look through these parameters and rate my data quality. That is one part of the story. Right, and it is telling you how good or bad, good, bad, or ugly is my data, which is which I am attempting to introduce it to my system. Okay, along with it, it is also trying to tell what are the data classes. In other words, the knowledge which is locked up. Is it holding address related data? Is it holding car related data? Is it holding pan related data? On top of it, what you can actually do, the system will also attempt to do it is it also looks into the compliance aspect of it. For instance, the GDPR, if it's the uh, PIDs which are getting, uh, uh, which, is, which, is, which is locked up in the data, the system will automatically apply masking techniques so that the identity of the customers will all be preserved. And you are actually, as far as your compliance and regulations are concerned, it is automatically taken care of. All of this is automated. All of this is powered by ML. Now, okay. coming to the second part of it, which is so, where, 
JJ, if I just intervene there. Yeah. So this, this is what you are showing in the screen is actually the tool that we are talking about. This is a user interface. And on the left-hand side, when JJ was clicking, you will go to the different options, different services, you enable it. So in the last 10 minutes, what JJ explained is most of the time, data scientists, they struggle to get the right data for their model curation. And they go through a lot of monotonous uh, work of categorization, classification, improving the data, everything. Now, this particular uh, feature of this tool, using the AI, not only, in, not only fetches where the data anomaly is, but also repairs it and also gives you an enterprise-wide business dictionary. So that if I press F5, I'll get a definition of GL underscore 007123 as general ledger, the other branch, this date, this category of data. So that's what it, uh, it automates. And just to give you an example, for an auto giant, we did this in the tune of auto data asset cataloging in the tune of 200,000 well under five minutes. That le level of automation we are bringing to our customers. Thank you. Over to you, JJ. Uh, yeah. So I'll, I'll, are we I'll... going for any poll question, by the way? Uh, yeah, JJ? I would want the second poll question to be put up. But before that, I just wanted to um, um, just get their attention back to the yeah. anchor slide which I've been using, right? Um, what we have done here is the pile of information which is put on the left hand side and uh, ML powered engine is taking it up and organizing the data for you. And while doing so, it is also rating the quality of the data for you. Uh, it's doing two things. It is using ML based algorithms to look at the quality of the data. And it's also using our most famed what's an NLP, uh, the language layer and taking the published business term and associating it with the columns. And that is what is powering you to help you to narrow down to the exact piece of data what you're looking for. Like in the instant case, we are attempting to try to build a risk-based model for which I need, to, the first step is for me to identify the data. And that uh, uh, that is what we are doing by searching for the term called account number and getting all the related information out. Yeah, uh, Rakesh, I think we can get the uh, poll question up. Okay, team, can we just flash the second poll question? Fantastic, thank you. So the question is in the model development cycle, what is the most time consuming area? I have my favorite. Um, let me see if it is aligned with your thought process. Okay, quickly choose your options and let's see. Which is the most notorious kid in the corner? Okay, the data evaluation. That is exactly what we're talking about, right, JJ? Absolutely. That is what we're going to do well, the second part of it. The first part of it is where we uh, automated the whole process of cataloging your data, organizing your data. Second is evaluation. And that is pretty much in line with what we have researched and built up tools around. So we will step into the second part of the whole story. Now I've got the data organized. Okay, let me share the screen. Okay, and now we've got the data organized. Now the second part of the journey is trying to build or consume the data and build up a model for me, for which the skill sets which are required is someone who's really good at stats, okay? And plus he should be a very good programmer, okay? There are a wide variety of tools um, uh, what we support. Uh, we support both open, open, open source as well as our proprietary uh, SPSS, which has been in industry and uh, only uh, the very few uh, enterprise grade machine learning tool, which is available in the market. Uh, very few are available as far as enterprise uh, grade is con uh, concerned. So we have got a host of tools which helps you to build the machine learning uh, model, right? And again, the challenge is, first thing is trying to evaluate the data for the set purpose of building the model uh, and the skill sets which is in demand is someone should be good at statistics someone should be good at another person should be good at uh, programming okay plus the person should also understand the domain often what happens is the knowledge of the domain is locked up with the industry experts the practitioners of the industry right if it's a financer or if it's it's the risk assessment right traditionally underwriters hold the knowledge and the idea here is teach the machine how to do things and the machine scales it up beyond what humans can scale. And we still supervise and understand and uh, um, uh, 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 understand the predictions which are coming out of the machines or the suggestions coming out of the machine. 
and use it as an auxiliary for us to uh, make the decision. Right. So when we look at it, right, the platform, what we hear use, uh, the second step of the journey is what we refer to as Watson Studio. Again, uh, the host of tools, what we support is Jupyter Notebook, R Studio, SPSS Smaller, and you've got R Powered Data Refinery, which is a data plumbing pipeline, UI based one. So in, uh, remember our theme, our, our, our philosophy is it should be self uh, servicing, right? That is let enabling a business user to sit on the system without much technical uh, know-how of using um, statistics or uh, programming, but build up a decent uh, data plumbing line. That is, uh, again, one good example, data refinery. Then you've got auto AI and then decision optimization. And if you look at the, see, a lot of us claim um, most uh, AI is a space which is actually, like Rakesh has said, it's the most abused term term in the industry. Um, I would say people can get away with murder in AI, okay? Anyone can talk anything about AI and then go scotch-free. But then the meat of the matter is the robustness in terms of what algorithms we support, what different frameworks are we bringing into the platform, how good or bad is our auto AI in terms of evaluating the outreach and the scope. So when you look at that, right, if you look, we support Spark libraries, uh, which is MLib. We support um, the Gradient Boost, XGBoost. We support Scikit. To name a very few, we have got a laundry list of 20 to 30 uh, different frameworks what we support. And as far as deep learning is concerned, we have support, we support TensorFlow, PyStar, uh, PyTorch, Cafe, and Keras, to name a few. And as we said, continuing with the philosophy, we run, uh, everything is containerized and can run on, uh, it runs on OpenShift. And the beauty is uh, we also support uh, for some of the customers, right, who have already made investment on big data platform. So from cloud pack for data, the containerized runtime compute can be pushed to even the Hadoop platform. So we even support that. And now coming back to the deep learning, right, we support the specially powered uh, 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 infrastructure like GPUs as well for aiding our deep learning. So that's the technology part of it, right? Now, what is, uh, what is actually the hindrance? Uh, when I look at the whole process, as for the poll, right, we are, we are spending the, good, um, the best amount of time trying to understand on cleansing the data, right? Which, which would mean data cleansing, feature engineering, and model selection. And these are the three things which follow under that pattern. And I, however, it is also related to parameter optimization or hyperparameter optimization. So all of this challenges what you face, right? In embracing ML, the gap which we were talking about, right? Being a good statistician, being a good programmer, and as well as being a good a domain expert, right? All of them are never ever found. It's very rare to find them in a single person. And that is what the skill gap is all about, right? And that is a big hindering block for you to embrace auto AI. So, uh, so going by the first poll where we pr predicted that when as per our experience, right? Building up a decent model takes somewhere close to six to 12 months. Uh, we want to reduce that gap. And that is where auto AI is coming. We have built models in terms of few days two weeks, uh, the complex ones we built it in a matter of weeks. Uh, the skill gap is going to be addressed because we have two kind of uh, our tools uh, broadly. One is low coding, wherein the bulk of the code is going to be written by our platform. And then you just take it, if you want to extend it, extend the code and then customize it and use it. Or no coding platform, wherein you don't have to write a single line of code, but through clicks, drag drops, you can actually go ahead and build up a machine, complex machine learning model. Okay, we're talking about we supporting ensembles, which most of comp computers don't really support. Um, then the second part is trying to discover the data in terms of machine learning, right? Trying to look at the data featuring, which is what you're going to spend your bulk of the time, rather than cherry picking the data and then handing over to auto A, which is what the trend is. What we do is you throw all the data into the system rather than cherry picking your data. The system will evaluate and tell what what is the good data versus bad data and what should be actually used for a given problem statement. In the current example, risk is what we are looking at, right? And the system does a bunch of experiment and also it will rank and give it to you saying that, hey, I've done 12 experiments, I've done eight experiments and this is the outcome. The first one, my best favorite ranking is towards this pipeline and it also tells what activity it has done. So without having to write a single piece of code or very less code, the system will evaluate uh, a bunch of algorithm for you and do it. So let's start off with a demo. So again, what you're seeing here is uh, coming back to Watson Studio. 
I am trying to build up a new auto AI experiment. Okay, I give it a name which is minimum, and on the second on the second drop down, what we are trying to do here is deciding what is the runtime engine hardware requirement for it. Now, post that what we are doing here is trying to pick the data set which needs to be analyzed. In the instant case, it is German credit data what we are looking at, which which we have narrowed down using the uh, business term search what we did in, in the previous uh, example. Then we are handing it over to the system. Now, the system has quickly analyzed your data, it's read, and what we are trying to do here is trying to tell the system what, what it needs to predict. Like in the instant case, I want to look through the customer profiles for the data which I'm throwing at it and tell whether a customer is at risk uh, and if it is at risk, what is the risk level uh, before I fund a loan or an insurance. So there are a lot of things what you can take control of even in the auto AI uh, through the UI, but then most of the cases leaving it uh, as is uh, to the default setting is also good. So in this uh, screen, what we are attempting to do is the data which is thrown at it, I've thrown all the columns and I'm trying to tell what column you have to predict for me. Um, and the system does an automatic split of your data into 90, 10. 90 is for understanding the problem statement. The machine learning is going through your data and understanding the data and 10% it's going to hold back and use it for the, uh, once hypothesis generated, it's going to do the test of the hypothesis, which is what is going to yield the accuracy of the model. Right. These are the columns which has been used and you can actually uh, exclude or uh, include the columns. So any auto AI uh, experiments, right? The beauty is the robustness of algorithm. I can always claim that I'm auto AI with very, very supporting very few algorithms. But in our case, right, the host of algorithm based on the problem statement, what I've said in the instant case to be risk, right? All I'm telling the system is as a domain expert, I just want, to, want you to uh, predict risk for me. Correct. The system has quickly brought in a laundry list of algorithm to be evaluated against this particular problem statement, which you're throwing at it. Again, you have an option of actually excluding or including for advanced users uh, or a mediocre user. He can actually choose which algorithm to pick uh, or which algorithm to include. Uh, again, I'm going with the default setting. The last setting is what we are trying to tell is how many rounds of experiments do you want to run, right? Uh, do I run 16 rounds of experiments or do I want to run uh, 12 rounds of experiments or do I want to uh, uh, run eight rounds of experiments or four rounds of experiments? More the round of experiments. The system is uh, ML right here in auto A. What it does is it goes in an iterative manner, looks through your data, evaluates all this algorithm for you without you having to know what algorithm is getting picked up. But again, the system is transparent. It's also trying to tell uh, help you to understand uh, what it is really doing with your data. This is a quick, uh, what we refer to as uh, data profiling, wherein the risk data is thrown at the system and the system is quickly profiling the data for you and showing the profile data output to you. That is, it's trying to look into the data and tell what is the frequency of reputation, whether the data is of categorical in nature or a numerical in nature, which eventually is going to decide what algorithm which needs to be picked up. So typically all of this will have to be coded by a data scientist. And you can imagine, right, the UI is actually, the system is doing a very good job where it, you just throw the data at the system and then click run experiment. The system has run the experiment for you. And if you see, right, it has ranked the pipeline for you. So it has run eight experiments and it has rated one pipeline for you. And if you see, right, the enhancements or the activity, what it has done is, it has run, done one round of hyperparameter optimization, which is actually tuning the algorithm to suit the data which has been thrown at it, okay? It is doing feature engineering. That is, it's trying to look through the data which is thrown at it, and the system is cherry picking the columns for you, saying that, hey, these particular columns are relevant to risk. The other columns has no bearing to risk whatsoever. Then it went ahead and did one more round of hyperparameter optimization uh, using gradient boost classifier. Okay, and that's hap that happens to be my best pipeline. So, so here, right, there's a pipeline comparison. So how is the system really uh, now uh, measuring each of the experiments? So there is a set statistical parameters which is put up in terms of accuracy, ROC curve, the loss log, F1 precision, so and so forth. The system is going to uh, create a hypothesis. Remember the 90 
we can split what we talked about the data and it's going to test the hypothesis against all of them and rate it across this myriad of uh, 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 matrices for the model statistically and going to tell you which which uh, algorithm you should pick uh, uh, and uh, what should be the activity which has to be carried out so this is an example where we are talking about a low code um, with, um, um, uh, um, uh, low code uh, example meaning um, out of the experiment a model is created as well as the code is also ready-madely created for you the model can be directly taken up and deployed and that is for the first uh, selection which is happening out here the second one is i can actually the activity which is carried out right like feature engineering hyperparameter tuning data alignment and all of that can also be converted into a notebook so the system creates a code for you and gives out so for those of uh, you who are fairly advanced or intermediate stage, right, they can actually take the code and further extend or customize it to their need. So out of the auto experiment, you get two options uh, from uh, in this one, in the low code example, what I'm talking about, wherein you get the model ready made created for you, evaluated by the system by, uh, for you, and then as well as the notebook, the source code given to you. So I'm just showing you how the system actually generates the notebook. Uh, I say, go ahead, show me the uh, uh, notebook. Here's the notebook, which is which is generated out of auto AI experiment. So nothing is uh, a black box to you. The system lets you control what it has to be uh, doing. The system also creates a code and hands it over to you. And of course, this is a model which is getting uh, generated from this whole experiment. So this is an example of what, what, what we refer to as a low code. Now I uh, I'll walk you through another example for those of you who who don't even want to do any coding at all. I just want to drag and drop and interact with the system, and still a very robust system what we build, right? So that is a second example where your data science, uh, your AI is coming into play and helping you out. Here, what AI has done is AI has taken over, evaluated the algorithm for you, did, did the data evaluation for you, did the data prep for you. Uh, and mind you, this whole experiment would, it would be running in a matter of a few minutes. And you have all the experiments available for you. You can pick and choose. So you can imagine what is the time saved in this whole process, right? Um, so this is the second example, what we refer to as a no-code example. Uh, to, so, uh, so we use our SPSS tool. Uh, so we call it Modeler Flow in Watson Studio. We click on it it launches the uh, thin client for you. And now you look at it, right? There are myriads of wizards available. The first one being auto classifier. If it's a classification problem, which has to be solved, right? You can drag in a cl auto classifier. The system looks at the data, will evaluate all the classification documents for you, uh, algorithms for you. The second one is auto numeric, which we refer to as if your target or what you're attempting to predict is of numeric nature, right? For instance, the sales number I want to predict. Uh, which product is going to contribute how much sales um, or which branch is going to contribute how, uh, how much sales. So in this case, what you're trying to predict is a, a numerical value. So then you can choose auto numeric and the system will evaluate a bunch of auto numeric um, algorithms for you automatically. Another one is referred to as uh, auto, class, uh, auto clustering. So this is what we refer to as unsupervised algorithm. Till now, all the algorithms, what you're looking at is uh, called supervised algorithm where the humans teach the system what to do by labeling the data and the system actually learns from human and uh, um, expands the uh, uh, knowledge. In auto classifier, what the system does is evaluates, evaluates a bunch of unsupervised algorithm. The, you don't have to tell system anything, just throw the data to the system. The system will use a certain breed of algorithms, what we refer to as unsupervised algorithm, uh, a little more intelligent version of algorithms. The last uh, set of uh, auto wizard, what we have in this uh, drag and drop environment is time series. So when we look at time series, right? Even you want to look at uh, data in terms of uh, time as a variable, like want to tell what is uh, my, uh, what is the forecast of sales for my uh, next quarter or uh, three months in advance, two months in advance, one week in advance, or if it's a manufacturing space, trying to predict when, uh, how many days uh, in advance, can I predict the mission uh, um, will go down? So if you look at it, these kind of algorithms, right? 
are what we refer to as time series or forecasting set of algorithms. So you have got a wizard even which evaluates these set of algorithms. The beauty here is uh, all you do is throw the data, add the data to the canvas, drag drop these uh, nuggets to the system and connect them and the system, uh, your whole data pipeline is available. Now, the important part is here, what we refer to as type. Uh, so this is where I'm going to tell what I'm trying to predict, right? If, uh, if I scroll down to the bottom most, I'm trying to tell the system, the problem statement is I want to predict risk. So I know that this is a classification problem, correct? I hit a save. The system is evaluating for you the data and trying to tell what is the nature of the data. So I've added an auto classifier. The auto classifier has evaluated a bunch of uh, algorithm for me. If I look at it, uh, this is where I can configure what we refer to as N symbols. N symbols is trying to break down models into much smaller chunks. A little further advanced uh, uh, um, um, uh, data science concept. Now, the system has already evaluated the algorithm, a set of uh, one, two, three, four, five algorithms for me, starting from random forest, random tree, XGBoost tree, C5, and KNN. Okay, and it's also trying to tell in terms of accuracy, I've, uh, I've ranked the algorithm for you. Uh, I didn't have to write a single piece of code. All I'm doing is drag and drop in the canvas. The system is pulling up the model evaluation metrics for you. Okay. It pulls out the confusion metrics for you, trying to tell how many true positives, true or false positives, and all of them have been identified and how good or bad is my prediction, which gives you insight into that. And uh, it also tells you what we refer to as feature importance, meaning what variable is having what kind of impact in your prediction. Right, and if you see, right, again, in this whole process, I didn't have to write a single line of code. All I have to do is drag and drop content. Uh, then in the example, what I've done here is uh, I've went with the C5 uh, algorithm and I've created a model, I right click and deploy the model as simple as that. So system has evaluated a bunch of algorithm for me and I've just picked the algorithm. Uh, this is what we refer to as a no code model. So in matter of a uh, few minutes, I'm able to evaluate uh, a bunch of algorithm, also able to create a model with all the right justification we should give you a confidence whether I should deploy. It's going ahead, evaluating the model for you um, uh, and uh, telling it, go ahead and deploy it. So can I get the third poll question? So uh, uh, JJ, just before that, what we are showing here, considering the positive of time, I'll be very brief. Um, so this, this auto AI feature of uh, model curation, not only limit, uh, the time that data scientists take in curating the model, maybe it will limit it to ten, to yeah. days um, and, and if not weeks, it will create great models, efficient models in a nick of a time. Now, one customer asked me that, Rakesh, is this going to replace all my data scientists if I am yes. going to use this platform? And the answer was no, it is not going to replace any of your data scientists, rather it will put them on steroids. So you know what I mean, right? So the, your data scientists will run like Flash, the DC comic character, so, and, and they will be super efficient. It is not to replace the data scientists, rather to make them more efficient in curating those models in just days time. Yeah, and, and just to put an example, we are not going to reply Popeye the Sailor Man. We are going to hand him over a can of spinach <laughs> to run effectively. Right. So that is what we are attempting to do here, right? And that is what a very perfect example of, see, we had been in this industry, we have solved multiple uh, customer problems uh, with our association uh, of uh, having SPSS in our portfolio. What we have done is we have taken all those learnings, all of our research, um, what IBM research has been pro uh, providing in terms of efficient algorithm, getting it on board and also embracing the open source platform and enabling you to, um, get things done much faster on our platform at the same time re reusing our hardware efficiently yeah okay can we have the third poll question and before that jj we don't have much time so how quickly can we show the model explainability or um, yeah i'll write a dive into model explainability um yeah so mohit can you help us with the poll question please okay so what are the challenges in adopting ai ml great go ahead guys choose your favorites and we'll know I, mean, I know I remember and I gave you this example that even if you have the best of the breed of the platform in adopting AI, till the time it doesn't explain you why it has chosen that set of data, business will not trust your outcome. As simple as that. Absolutely. 
the, you know, a lot of companies were providing model factories and all, but then, you know, oh, that's great. There you go. Skill gap also, <laughs> right? Wonderful. <laughs> so we're talking so, about replacing the data scientists. We don't need to. <laughs> Actually, there's a dearth of skill set. And that is exactly what this gentleman, Watson Studio is going to address. All right. Okay, over to you, JJ. So now what we have done till now is looked at the AI coming in aid and helping you to organize um, the data for you in the first phase. Second is quickly building up a model. Now, once a model is built up, right, the data science job doesn't really, scientist job doesn't stop there. I need to monitor the model because the environment is very dynamic. Let's take the example of COVID, right? With COVID onsetting, the customer behavior has changed drastically in terms of what they really want to buy. Uh, the choice of products have changed. People are more focused trying to get more insurance. People are more focused trying to look into um, um, uh, saving kind of portfolios and stuff like that, right? So you can imagine, right, how dynamic in the modern day the data is. And sometimes whatever hypothesis you have created can quickly drift away and get into um, 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 uh, uh, um, uh, uh, get into a stage where what we call it as a model getting drifted and try to give you inaccurate uh, predictions, right? Because it is not accounting for the modern changes. So that is where our second set of, uh, the third set of tool comes in, what we refer to as open scale AI. Again, we use, uh, um, um, wherein we actually deploy the model and when, for, when we did a survey, right? This is what has come out. Um, 63, 60% of the companies see that once I deploy a model. JJ, we are still not able to see your PPT. We are seeing your. Uh, okay. Yeah. I'm so, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so this is a survey result, right? Um, uh, where 60% of the companies uh, feel that once I deploy a model, right? I still have to follow regulatory constraints. Like I can't be racially profiling people. I can't give unfair advantages based on genders and stuff like that. So how do I address that part in my machine learning? Because end of the day, right, machine learning is a system which looks at a sample set of data, understands the pattern of the data which is thrown at it. And potentially inadvertently, it can get into what we refer to as uh, racial profiling or things like that. How do I circumvent that problem is one problem. Uh, the second problem what people look at is the technical ability or the agility in terms of accommodating modern changes or quick changes or responses from the system, from the data to my model once it's deployed. So with that, I will just pause and quickly jump over to the demo uh, because of the possibility of the time. So no matter what stage your model is on, right? Uh, be it in the development, which is your pre-production or in the test, um, you can, uh, take help of what we refer to as uh, what's an open scale AI. And what it basically does is it monitors your model once the model is created and tell how good, bad and ugly as far as the model is concerned, how agile is your model, how biased is your model, which is what we talked about the uh, regulatory concerns. So here in this example, right, we have deployed uh, the same model, but in three different stages. One is in pre-production, but in the approved stage. Another one is in a pre-production stage. Third one is in a production stage. So what it basically does is it is like creating a AI powered data scientist on top of the deployed model who will be monitoring the model real time. Um, this is again, a very cutting edge technology. Often what happens is the agility once the model is deployed, right? To accommodate the new changes and uh, come out with the second iteration of the model and deploying it and account for the changes is often time consuming. Remember six to 12 months is what you took for the first cut of the model. Now accommodating the changes may cost you somewhere near three to four months, right? Often business can't wait that long. So this is a system which actually sits on top of the deployed model, no matter in what stage it is. And it looks through and looks, takes care of your biasness part of it, which is your compliance part of it. So here's an example. Let me quickly open it and look at it. So, Okay, so here is what the system is doing. Once you have evaluated a model, you deploy the model. But this system actually sits on top of the model on a real time basis. You can configure at what period it wants to, uh, what frequency uh, you want to monitor it. It can go up to seconds, to hours, to minutes, to days, to months. Okay, at meaning your model once deployed, the system keeps uh, uh, looking at all the quality metrics on a real time basis without you having to write a single piece of code. Your model could be receiving within Cloud Pack for data on uh, IBM uh, uh, Watson ML, or it could be receiving somewhere else outside in Azure ML, or it could be receiving in SageMaker of AWS. But we can, uh, open scale AI can monitor all those models which is deployed anywhere, and then keep track 
be like a data scientist sitting on top of it and monitoring it on a real time basis. That is as far as the quality of the model is concerned, right? The true positive rates, ROC curves and stuff like that. You can configure thresholds. Uh, so whenever the threshold is made, like I'm pulling the last three months worth of data and it's saying that, hey, under ROC curve metrics is actually getting um, you know, breached uh, uh, on the date of April 14th at 5.30 when you score the data. Now, the second part is the fairness or the biasness, right? Remember, we are talking about the examples where uh, regulatory aspect have to be enforced. Now, out of the feature set, what you're looking, uh, you're monitoring, right? I said, I've set in two fairness features. There is uh, six and age. And if you see, there's a red mark put up, meaning I was unfair uh, based on gender. Now, what led to that is what the system is trying to look at. So I look at my training uh, data set and uh, what, what you notice instantaneously is that the female representation in the sample is almost one third the male representation, right? Meaning male has more uh, in the sample, what I've outlined for training, there is a more uh, representation of male uh, um, uh, customer profiles. Hence the patterns emerging from male gets more uh, uh, fair treatment compared to the female, right? Now the system, has identified a problem for you and the system automatically what we refer to as does uh, a unbiasing also for you. And mind you, it's does an unbiasing, meaning wherever a female um, has got an unfair risk assessment, which happens to be higher, the system will debias and it will tell that, hey, I have debias from 96% to 100%. That is what it is showing. And if you click on it, it will tell you what is in terms of percentage, how each of these, right? Uh, we have configured the gender and uh, age um, and how we have improved the biasness of the nature. Now, remember the system is debiasing the transaction and presenting it to you, but it is not enforcing. You can still choose to go with the prediction or uh, choose with the debiased output. So in effect, what the system has done is uh, because of the biasness, it has drastically created a model on the fly for you. We refer to as shadow model using uh, uh, data perturbation techniques. So this is the transaction and uh, each scoring activity, the system will pull up. So what we refer to each scoring is submitting the variables to the system and tell customer profile details to the system and asking the system to come out, tell me whether this is going to be a risk, as, uh, do the risk assessment for me. So when you look at it, right, the features which has contributed for a risk on the positive influence side and the negative influence side, meaning negative is risky, positive is no risk. So if you see the system actually does the, an explanation of the outcome and it is telling in terms of it's quantitatively expressing which feature is contributing and what factor is actually contributing you to say that something is risky versus non-risky. The beauty is again, going by our underwriter example, right? He also has an option of playing around real time with the data by manipulating these data so that he knows that if I play around with certain features, can I really, what is the outcome? So that is what the inspect is doing. If you see here, you can actually do a real time uh, uh, changing of the values and see what is the analysis the moment I hit run analysis. Now this is post deployment once a model is created out. Again, a big um, a chunk of worry is trying to embrace a AI model, trying to understand, now um, looking at the prediction which is coming out of the AI model as a black box is a big hindrance for anyone to embrace, right? And this system is taking that part away. At the same time, the system is enforcing a, reg a regulatory access um, um, uh, constraints in terms of uh, gender profiling and stuff like that and trying to rectify it without having to wait for the data scientist to rectify the model again, use a three months period to uh, uh, give you the second cut of the model. The system is sitting on top of it immediately on the fly, creating a own model with the AI powered techniques. And then using, uh, looking at the outcome, it is actually pulling out uh, the explainability part and also putting out English words so that you understand. Uh, frame and summarize this whole uh, thing in English trying to tell why a certain uh, um, prediction is coming this way or that way. So that is what I had, um, um, uh, Rakesh. Um, great, great. Thank you, JJ. So that means uh, a data scientist can simply copy and paste the screenshot on this English and give it to the marketing team. And it will make sense fact, because it is in plain English, isn't it? Uh, right. In fact, going what, to any jargon there. Yeah, we are addressing the skill gap and we are letting the domain experts who has the actual yeah. knowledge of running the business to play around with this sophisticated system. Fantastic. I can get used to that. Thank you. Thanks a lot, JJ. Um, over to you, uh, Nishant and team, uh, Mohit. You know. 
Thank you. Thanks a lot, JJ. That was indeed a detailed and insightful demo. And thanks a lot, Rakesh, for your insights as well, sharing about customer case studies. While I can see that Rakesh has answered most of the questions live during the webinar, however, in the interest of time, I'm afraid that we won't be able to take more questions. However, that said, the audience can anytime send their questions to the IBM teams in the coordinates. And uh, the team will get back to you. Actually, you can see the coordinates on the screen. So the team will get back to you. And uh, we also have a short survey at the end of the webinar. So please make sure that you participate in the same after the webinar ends. So that's all the time we have for today. I again, thank the audience for their time and interest in participating, participating today. We thank you and we look forward to welcoming you in the next webinar soon. Thank you. Thank you.